This is KGW News at Noon. Thanks for joining us here at Noon. I'm Drew Carney, and we start today's newscast with an update on the deadly Max train stabbing that happened in Northeast Portland this past Friday. Court documents show the attack appeared to be unprovoked. 51 year old Shondell Larkin will be in court later today, facing multiple charges, including second degree murder. Police say when they arrived at the 82nd Avenue Transit Station around 6 o'clock Friday night, they found a man on the platform who was already dead and Larkin was still on the train with a knife and bloodstained clothing. Surveillance footage, which showed Larkin repeatedly stabbing the victim, seemed to all happen without him being provoked. Larkin later told investigators that he heard voices that made him believe that the victim might kill him. KGW's Kyle Aboshi will be in court today and will bring us the latest coming up here on the News at 4. New at noon, police are investigating a crash that happened right around 7 o'clock this morning along Interstate Avenue in the Overlook neighborhood of North Portland. Police say a car hit someone who was walking there and they were taken to the hospital with life-threatening injuries. The driver, meanwhile, stayed on the scene and is cooperating with investigators. So far, though, there is no word on any cause. We also have an update this afternoon on a story we first brought you last week about scammers in Washington County. The sheriff's office there says they're trying to sell fake jewelry on the side of the road. KGW's Art Edwards spoke to a man who experienced the scam firsthand while trying to help a stranger. Mark Lewis wanted to do the right thing when he saw what looked like a motorist in trouble on Highway 219 in Washington County. It turned into a frightening incident that sheriff's deputies are now investigating. The incident happened here along Highway 219 on Monday afternoon. Lewis was in his work vehicle along with a passenger. We saw a guy with a passenger door or a driver's side door open and it looked like he was shaking the driver. And next thing we know, he steps out and he starts waving us down. So my first thought is this guy is having a heart attack or having a you know diabetic episode, something. So we just pulled off right in front. They were getting ready to get out to see if they could help. And that's kind of when things got a little wild. The guy that waved us down walked up the passenger side of the door and just immediately opened the door. And he started like leaning in. He had his hand on my apprentice's leg. He told a story of being a millionaire from Dubai and needed money to help a family member. He offered jewelry for cash. Lewis said he knew that he needed to get away. As he drove away, the black Mercedes SUV with California plates and the men inside began to follow. Terrified. Yeah. I'm not ashamed to say it. I was terrified. At that point, it became, you know, oh, those idiots, whatever. And then it became, dude, we got to get it. We, we have to go. We have to get out of here. We have to, we have to get home. Eventually, the SUV left them. Lewis was shaken by the incident, but says he'd still like to help people in need. He'll be cautious and has some advice to pass along. Make sure you're going to go home to your family. Make sure you go home to your family. And so if what you're going to do is going to not get you home, don't do it. Go home to your family. The Washington County Sheriff's Office says they have had several reports of similar incidents in the past two weeks. They advise people to be cautious when approached by someone they don't know. Art Edwards, KGW News. All right, let's take a look at some of this afternoon's other local headlines, starting with Legacy Health and Regents, who were able to reach a deal, a last-minute deal last night ahead of yesterday's negotiating deadline. That deal means Legacy Health Care providers will remain in network for Regents members, saving thousands of patients from getting hit with potential out-of-pocket costs. Legacy released a statement saying it's grateful for everyone's patience. It also says anyone with an appointment should still go when they're scheduled and anyone who canceled an appointment during the recent uncertainty between Regents and Legacy should contact their provider to reschedule. Meanwhile, in Vancouver, police are asking for help to find this missing woman and her five-year-old daughter. Lauren and Elena Morin were last seen yesterday on Northeast 88th Avenue, and police have connected them to a red 2015 Mazda CX-5 with Washington plates. They also believe Lauren is suffering from a medical emergency. If you see either of them, call Vancouver Police. Bottle drop services at this downtown Portland Plaid Pantry will stay suspended for the month of April. This store sits on the corner of Southwest 11th and Jefferson and has been a hot spot for drug users who turn in cans for cash to support their habit. Portland's 90 day fentanyl emergency task force paused bottle return services at that plaid pantry and the Safeway we just saw across the street back on March 2nd. Portland police say that area of downtown near the South Park blocks 
is flooded with drug use and drug dealing. The city's 90 day fentanyl emergency is scheduled to end on May 1st. Also this afternoon, we know a snowboarder died over the weekend on Mount St. Helens after a fall that was caused by an avalanche. The Northwest Avalanche Center says the snowboarder was near the top of the mountain, standing on an overhang of packed snow that broke away underneath him. The Avalanche Center says snow packed overhangs like that get weaker once the weather starts to get warmer. All right, we're going to check in now for our local weather forecast with Chris McGinnis in the Weather Center. What's happening there? Chris? Looking for Rod Hill. I thought he'd be out on the golf course here. This is, of course, Rod's on vacation for a couple of days. This is the live look out in Aloha from the Reserve Golf Course and Vineyard. You can see hardly a cloud in the sky out there. It's just a beautiful day on the west side. We'll take it a little farther west to the Oregon coast. Clears the bell right now in Newport, right? Just blue sky there and up on the mountain. This is actually a pretty cool shot from Oregon's veterans home in the Dalles. We've had just a little bit of a cloud cap over Mount Hood on and off throughout the day. I've actually got a time lapse on this and I'll show you that coming up in just a couple of minutes. It's been cool to watch that evolve, but outside of that, it has been uh, a bright sunshiny day here across most of the region. We are 57 degrees at noon at PDX. It's now 58 in Hillsborough, 60 in Tigard already. And as we slip south in the Blama Valley, 61, the warm spot on this map, or excuse me, can be 62, the warm spot on this map. Kaiser checking in with 61. Uh, the plan for the rest of the day, lots of sun, mid 60s at three o'clock. I've got forecast highs right around 69 or so here in Portland today. We'll tack on a few more degrees tomorrow. And then Drew, we know that we usually get, you know, two, three, four rounds of spring before we get actual spring, right? <laughs> this is a little taste of, yeah. uh, I won't say winter, but there are some changes coming our way midweek. We'll look at those coming up in just a few minutes. All right, Chris, we appreciate it. This team is, it rivals any team I've ever been a part of. Um, what they did this year is not common. It's not normal. Um, we're not supposed to be here. But we are a fearless, gritty, tough display of competitive fire and passion and togetherness that is as inspiring as anything. That was Oregon State's women's basketball coach piling on the praise for his team. After the Beaver season came to an end yesterday, they lost the top ranked South Carolina in the Elite Eight, 70 to 58. Two more games still have to be played tonight to complete the women's final four, including a matchup here in Portland at the Moda Center between USC and UConn. That one starts tonight at 615. KGW's Art Edwards will be there to cover the game for us. The winner will face either Iowa or LSU in the final four. Those two schools face off today in Albany. Tip off in that one is set for 415. There was some controversy over the weekend during the women's basketball action here in Portland. The NCAA confirmed that the three point lines on the Moda Center court were measured incorrectly for every game played between Friday and yesterday. For more on this, here's KGW's Evan Watson. A huge moment for Portland, hosting Sweet 16 and Elite Eight games for the women's college basketball tournament, stained by a coat of paint. I walked in and there was measuring happening and I was sitting next to a friend who was like, are they measuring the three point line? The NCAA says the Moda Center court was marked incorrectly all week. One three point line longer than the other. Before the Texas North Carolina State game Sunday, coaches walked it off and officials even measured the lines with a tape measure. Fearing a delay throwing off their team or losing their network TV slot, the coaches decided to play anyway. Well, I hate to say this, but I have a lot of colleagues that would say only in women's basketball. I mean, it's, it's a shame, really, that it even happened. But it is what it is. North Carolina State, who advanced to the Final Four, took it in stride. Easier to say after a big win. Would it have mattered where the three-point line was? Uh, today? Not at all. Not at all. <laughs> they don't shoot at that thing anyway, so it don't matter. I was worried about if our players were going to have to wait an hour to play. Uh, I like the fact we could jump out there and play the game. Both coaches said they don't think it affected the outcome of the game. Teams switched sides at halftime. But plenty of people, like Texas fan and University of Oregon assistant professor Courtney Cox, have questions. We have this moment where the athleticism is in a, in a place where it's better than it's ever been. We have like more focus, more media coverage, the things that these players deserve. And then we have these little moments that kind of remind us of the work that's still there for us. 
The NCAA released a statement saying the court will be corrected before tomorrow's Elite Eight game in Portland, adding, while the NCAA's vendor has apologized for the error, we will investigate how this happened in the first place. The NCAA is working now to ensure the accuracy of all court markings for future games. The NCAA regrets the error was not discovered sooner. Cox says she's curious how the players feel about the mess up. I'm interested from them. Do they feel it was off? Or is it also like the mental component, right? Once you know it's not right, is that is that throwing you off? I feel like that's a such an interesting mental component of like mind-body connection. And a big mistake like this one brings natural questions of accountability and equity for the NCAA and the men's and women's tournaments. The fans are there, the athletes are there, the sport is there, and we really just kind of need everyone else to catch up. Including the three-point line? I mean, especially the three-point line, right? <laughs> Evan Watson, KGW News. So just a few moments ago, we did get an update from the NCAA. They say that one of the three-point lines was nine inches short of regulation. They say it was a mistake made by a contractor. And as Evan just reported on, that line has been fixed ahead of tonight's game between USC and UConn.